Well, look at this, it's seven o'clock. It's time for Courtney. It's Courtney time. <laughs> that's a sad, that's a sad statement. <laughs> <laughs> right, before, before we start, we want to welcome our new meet members. I think Eva joined today, but she's on the road, so she won't be joining us in person, but everybody's been introduced to Christine um, from, from Gainesville. So, Courtney, it's all yours. Okay, take it away, Terry. Well, Grammatophil, let's start with Grammatophil and Scriptum. Okay. Um, that, I, that's still, every time I see it in real life or even in a photo, I, I'm always surprised at how, how striking the flowers are. But if you see it in person, usually your first thought is, oh my God, where would I put that if I had it home? Because they get to be so huge. But that's one of the nice things about that particular species. They grow really well. They produce lots and lots of flowers. They just need a lot of space. It's certainly not a windowsill type plant, but if you got a place to keep it in the, in the very dead parts of winter and can get it outside for the rest of the year, uh, that can be grown pretty easily here in Florida. Now, Courtney, did you look at that picture on the bottom right, the way Deborah has the plant in one of those concrete rounds to make so, so it doesn't fall over? Yeah, and that's, that's a good point, So That's what it would take, something really <laughs> heavy, because those spikes can get really heavy, especially with the number that, that you have there. Um, the real trick to those, and I've seen some magnificent ones in shows, just so big you wondered how in the world they ever got it there. Uh, the real trick is to have it so that the inflorescences are kind of more straight up, but their tendency is to do just what this one's doing here, lean towards the light which of course is gonna happen if you've got it in a nye or a pool enclosure, or something like that. I'll bring you a plate, yes, both of us. Okay, next, oh, some fantastic Oncidionae. Um, Sherry Baby, whenever we have one, I always mention it's gotta be the most uh, cloned plant around, but what's really interesting about this particular one is this is a different clone than the norm. This is one that's, that's almost solid uh, I guess that color is maroon, but it's solid, deep purple, uh, whereas the others have uh, different amounts of other colors it's mixed in there. But I'll guarantee you the one thing that they all have in common is that fragrance. That fragrance is just phenomenal. Okay. And, and then Oncidium Heaven Scent, um, that's another one that has incredible fragrance. And if I remember correctly, they have one of the same parents or they've got a parent in common, which brings that uh, fragrance to them. Okay, what else is there? We've got Spastoglottum. Oh no, this is a Wilsonara, but really it's an Oncidium. And I was gonna spend a little, more, little time today talking about the naming and the renaming, I guess as a way to, to talk about it. But there are some advantages to the renaming. Uh, for us old timers that were used to the old ones and spent all this time learning what was what, now we just have to go back and, and relearn things. But in this case, it's an Oncidium instead of a Wilsonara, which is, is easier to, to say and keep in mind. <laughs> I think there's something else on that screen, Terry, right? Yep. Yeah, go, go to the, yeah. Yeah, there we are. Okay, we got the Macroclinium aurora. That's Leslie's. That's a beautiful thing. I had never really seen that before. It looks like it's a pretty small uh, species. Really nice, cute. That's what you call the cute index high on that particular thing. <laughs> looks like it's mounted on maybe uh, cypress. And then the Spathalotum, it's just, you know, they always just take your breath away when they get big. And they last a long time. I think the biggest surprise to me about that particular species is how well they grow in our area. Um, there was a neighbor who had theirs outside 12 months of the year. And I kept waiting for it after these cold snaps to, to start showing brown leaves, but it never did. It came right through and was flowering like it was in the tropics still. Beautifully grown. And that is, I can't see whose plant that is. Susan? Susan Mill Street. Yeah, that's really, really pretty. And I like the way that's hanging there. That's the way you, that's the way they like to grow. Shame we can't have them that way all time, all year long. Although maybe we can. Well, remember I was talking about the Oncidian A and the naming and renaming. Well, it doesn't always work out to our advantage because here we go from Miltasia to Bretonia, um, <laughs> this Cowie's Choice Tropical Fragrance. And 
the thing that I guess is missing in a lot of the a lot of the advertisement for these uh, clones is the fact that many of them are extremely fragrant. And unless you've grown one of these, you also don't appreciate how easy they are to grow. I mean, they can be grown into big plants really fast, um, and they're very rewarding for for new folks, especially people who just you know getting used to growing orchids and and it's nice to have some reward for all your, your efforts. They're good learner plants and they're pretty inexpensive too. So you can get a half dozen of them and kill three and you still got plenty of uh, plants to occupy space. So you gotta learn on something and these are good ones to learn on. And there's Presidium Golden. Can't quite see what else that is golden there. Golden gamete. Plant. What is it? Golden Gamete. Golden Gamete, White Knight. That, the, one of the, the aspects of this particular group I just call them intergeneric on CDNA, is the fact that there are so many ways in which the colors can be expressed on the petals, sepals, and the lip. Even in a single hybrid, you can see such differentiation that you often don't even recognize that they're siblings. This is really pretty. A nice, nice clone. That's Linda's. Courtney, uh, Carolyn asked whether, I think it was back on the Insidium slide, whether they can take full sun. No, they can't. I, I say the, spas, the, the, the spasolatum, that can take a lot of sun. It, it's a, it likes probably the same kind of sun that, that a Cattleya or, or a, even a Vanda can take, but they do have to have a lot of air movement if you're gonna give them a lot of sun. Because they've, they've got those thin leaves and they will burn fairly easily. The main trick for those is when you bring them outside to introduce them to the sun slowly. And that's where I see most of the people getting burns on them. Um, I wouldn't recommend you know, putting them on a fence post out in full sun all day long because they will burn. And uh, Now, Carolyn is saying that it's a grammatophyllum that she was really asking about. Oh. About full sun. I don't think, I, you know, I've never seen one grown in full sun. Mostly they're in, in, uh, in shade, maybe 40%, 30% yeah. shade, something like that. Somebody needs to experiment. <laughs> Carolyn, it's up to you. And, and you know, one of the things about them, I think if you experiment and you burn it back, well, it, it keeps it from getting, going out of the pot too fast. Okay, where are we? Did we? Okay. I just love the fact that we have Miltoniopsis to see. And these are Suzanne's, um, and she grows them inside in the summertime. Uh, they are some of the most charming orchids, and it's just unfortunate that we can't grow them um, here, unless we do what Susan's doing, and that is um, put them inside in the heat of the summer. Once the temperatures start getting up in the low 80s, uh, they just don't like it. Now, if you had a way of keeping the roots cool, um, you probably could grow them in even warmer temperatures. And I do know people in North Carolina who used to grow them in clay pots in sphagnum, and they actually did pretty well, even though the temperatures in greenhouses there typically get just as warm as here. But they never quite had uh, the same number of flowers, and they always just look like they weren't quite uh, as nice as, as what you see um, where, where people grow them in cooler conditions. But beautiful examples here, different colors, um, Miltoniopsis, Ambry's Charm, Cream Puff, Miltoniopsis, Boulevu. Yeah, these just beautiful things. Yeah. And you can see they're growing well. When I saw this zygo, I just said that that must be something in real life. A zygopetalum advanced Australia. It's got an award of merit, which says it's been recognized, but the flatness of the petals and sepals and that intense color on that lip. And I'll bet this is one of the ones that's fragrant. And you only have to have one in a whole green, big greenhouse to have the whole greenhouse full of fragrance if that is a fragrant form. There are really two types, one that, one that has fragrance and one that doesn't. They're both beautiful forms of, uh, within the group, but that's really nice, beautiful. There is a message from Ken about the gramophylum. <clears throat> Ken says, the more sun that it's given, the more spots, not burns, that will show on the foliage. It's a balance between giving them the right amount of sun to flower and not too much where the foliage is unsightly. I would, I would bet that that's, that's the key, is getting enough sun, but not too much. But that's the case with all of them. So if you've got one and you want to experiment, um, just do it carefully. Each year, maybe introducing a little more sun than the previous year. 
So if you're blooming them and they don't have many spots, then that probably suggests you're not giving it enough sun. So we have an array of different uh, Phalaenopsis. Um, the one in the center, it's unnamed. That's, that's got Goldie and Pioker in the background. It's a, it's a mutant thing that popped out in Taiwan that's been used to produce all sorts of, of spots and unusual patterns on the petals and sepals. Um, probably that one on the right, um, something cranberry. I can't quite see what the name is, but. Formosa cranberry. That's, that's probably got it in it too. What is interesting about the one right there, um, Formosa cranberry, is if you look at how the, the individual spikes are arranged, the inflorescence has multiple branches. And that is a characteristic that one is always trying to obtain in, in hybrids. Um, and then if you look at the one below it, um, which is a, another one that we used to call a Dorotinopsis, um, they both probably have what we um, used to call Doritis uh, pulcherma. And this one, the queen something, is, uh, is a good example of what those flowers and what Doritis does as a parent, sometimes even several generations away. They have upright uh, sp uh, spikes. And the interesting thing about it, um, in nature, they have these upright spikes because they grow in tall grass. They don't grow attached to trees. They grow down in amongst these grasses. So the long inflorescence is necessary to get the flowers to where pollinators can see it. For just a long time, they were considered separate species because of that characteristic. And there were some other morphological aspects to the flowers, too, that separated them. But now they've been placed in Phalaenopsis. And that's probably where they belong, given the range of, of flower forms and inflorescent types that we see in, in Phalaenopsis. You'll notice that one of the other characteristics of Doritis that shows in this particular plant Notice how the flowers are arranged on the inflorescence. They're not shingled. They're basically in a world pattern. And an awful lot of uh, judges don't like that, but it is a beautiful uh, characteristic if they're uh, staked just like this one is with nice upright, uh, I guess that's bamboo in there, but that's beautiful. And on the left is a Bigfoot. Um, again, it's unnamed. Uh, when that popped out in Hawaii, I want to, I think that was a Carmella hybrid or I can't remember if it was Carmella. It was one of the, the I think it was mushrooms. Carmella. Was it? Yeah. yeah. That popped out and, and that was all the rage for a while. But what it essentially is, is the, the lip, instead of being in the normal form um, where part of the lip is wrapped around in a kind of a tight uh, circle, um, the lip just flares out and has the beautiful patterns. Uh, and now they've got them on all sorts of of uh, colors, patterns, spots, semi-albas, you name it. Carl Smith has done a bunch with, the, with this too. And it's just something I find really attractive, maybe because it's just different. Um, but beautiful, beautiful flowers. I think we're missing one, aren't we? Yeah, the lower left. Yeah. Well, the, up, the upper, let me get the upper left first. That's uh, Phalaenopsis fullers. Looks like number 3545. And a couple of things to note on this, they've got Doritinopsis. And what, what would happen is a Dor Doritis would be brought into the, the lineage many generations back and the characteristics that Doritis brought to the, the hybrid are long since gone. So when you look at this, it looks just like the standard Phalaenopsis that we see with, which is bred for shingling, beautifully grown here with shingles. Um, can't quite see all of them just because it's impossible to see all the open flowers. Uh, but this has also got the golden pioker or something like it in the background. Beautifully grown. Okay, the bottom one now. Bottom left. Can't see the, the, the tag on that one, Terry. Uh, uh, it's as high as I can move it. Okay. Yeah, I don't have a name on this one. I. Usun picture. Yeah, I, I I did I actually could I actually saw it, Terry. I just wanted you to say it. <laughs> 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 I've I've yet to figure out exactly how to spell that or pronounce that. You got that me. Name. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? I think you're as close as I was. <laughs> but this is this is a beautiful example of uh, of the influence of uh, a particular um, species. 
Can anybody tell me what that species probably is? Is that orchid world? Let's see, none. The miniature, it's a small species. You're probably going to tell us it's equestrious. It is. Rose just yelled that from the background. She's heard it so many times. She she automatically responds. <laughs> but uh, I, I love I love the fact that that species has led to to stripes, uh, miniatures, semi albas, and everything. And this is just perfect example of of uh, hybridizing that brought in some yellow from other parents. Um, the equestrious stripes. Um, little, I'm guaranteed it's a short, short spike and the smaller plant, just beautiful. That's, that's the kind of thing when you see one that become, that's a huge plant with several kikis, they just, um, they just win the show. You just can't ignore them. They're too pretty. Even though individual flowers aren't spectacular, um, each one is delicate and got all the kind of things that hybridizers were after. Okay, we can move on now. Did you get that one? I did. That's the one I said is is got. It's unnamed. Um, yeah, we got, that. I, got that. I just saw I just saw that named up in John Stanton's place, and I can't think of what the name is. The the golden pioker hybrid. I'm still surprised we don't see more renanthras. This is Akihito, the emperor. Um, this is a second generation renanthra, and. I think that most of the people who who use and breed uh, renanthras just don't take them many generations because the beauty really is in the species. These these beautiful um, sepals that are flared, uh, just nice as could be. Um, they're called uh, dancing ladies, and you can sort of see it. The real trick in breeding renanthras is to get plant, get hybrids that flower early and grow fairly quickly and don't get huge. They can get 15, 16 feet high and be two and three feet across some of the species that are out there. So the real trick is to get them miniaturized and bloom fast, especially if you're a hybridizer and sell them. You don't want to wait 10 years to have a plant that still hasn't bloomed yet yeah. to sell. But that's a really nice one. Here's a real good example of why we love the I say that in quotes, why we love the new vanding, vanda or naming system. Now Neophoenicias and Ascophoenicias, they're all vandas. So you can just look at the little flowers and you can say vanda and you're okay. Um, <laughs> but Neophoenicia is a, to me a special kind of thing. I still like the name, particularly when we're talking about the species. Um, this is Neophoenicia falcata, um, being grown extremely well and, and nicely um, shown here in this, this basket. That's a good job, Linda. And then on the other side, we have Ascophoenicia cherry blossom. So we call it Vanda, which it really is, but it's got the Neophoenicia in it. And you've got other Vandaceous things that what we used to call Ascocentrum. And they're really just miniature Vandas that have a lot of color. And that's, that's a characteristic that is very valued. And again, these grow really fast. They bloom readily. They do not have to have the same light requirements, although they'll take a lot of light. But here you can just really see um, Sue's done a great job of leaving the, the basal kikis still around the plant. So they're all together. And then look at all the inflorescences there are. And if you look carefully, you can see just continual inflorescences coming out. Beautifully grown, Sue. Yeah, and the nice thing about them is that they're pretty cold tolerant. That's true. I should have mentioned the Neophoenicia actually lives in places where they have pretty hard frost. So that's that's one of the advantages of bringing the um, the Falcata in. Rhinchostylus retusa. Um, there are a number of Rhinchostylus species. Uh, the ones that are probably best known um, have. Uh, bright colors and this one is a uh, kind of a muted color but the number of flowers are really spectacular on them and again as they get larger they will do much the same as we just discussed um, with the the falcata um, they will get kikis and they will have lots and lots of inflorescences 
these do like a good bit of light. So that's the thing about them. Give them a lot of air movement, a lot of light, and you'll get a big plant and they'll have lots and lots of inflorescences. Beautiful. And then on the other side, I think we have a Rhynchostylus hybrid. Can't see the, the label. Yeah, on that's that. loose neary, so it's with the falcata. Yeah, that's right. So, and the, the color is coming um, from the Rhynchostylus. There's a species, is it Celestis? I can't remember yeah, the name. Yeah, I think it. it is Celestis. Yeah, there's a species that has these beautiful blue flowers, and it is interesting that it dominated for color, which is, you know, not uncommon when breeding with the falcata. Okay, there's another one there. Oh. Arangus Elro. I'm surprised we don't see more Arangus um, around. They're related to Angracoids, and almost all the group has these has white, um, more ivory or greenish colored flowers, and they all have these this beautiful nectary that hangs down uh, for for moths to pollinate. Some are hard to grow, but most of them grow fairly easily once you figure out what they need, whether they need a lot of light, low light. I've not had much luck with growing these in high light. For me, they grow best in lower light. And most of the time when I see them growing well in a greenhouse, they're in what I would call Phalaenopsis to, to uh, oh, maybe uh, miniature Cattleya light. They don't like real bright, bright, but they do pretty well once you get them started and get them established in some kind of a pot. They like good drainage, just like Vanda's. Selogeny pandorata. This used to be called the black orchid. Now we have really true black or orchids and some of the things uh, Fred Clark has produced. But if you look at the lip, you see where it got the name, um, that, that almost dark purple. And really, if you look carefully, and uh, Terry's got it focused down there, you can see those little tiny hairs um, that are just almost black. They're so, dark, so purple, they're, they're, they look black. And then you see a little color in between. This is also an extremely fragrant species. Um, one of the, the few selogenies that we usually see uh, around. A lot of the selogeny pandorata that you see for sale are actually hybrids of pand uh, selogeny pandorata to one of its own hybrids. But you can't tell them apart because it is such a dominant uh, species. Lots of flowers on this. OK. Chinorchus fragrans. If you were looking for the cutest orchid out there um, and you didn't have a lot of space, this is it, Chinorchus fragrans. And this is Leslie's plant. I think I've seen this growing at her place before. This is a tiny plant, but the, the, uh, the bang for the buck is the number of flowers you get. And again, a species that will produce basal kikis and you can have a plant real quickly with seven or eight basal kikis that are blooming size, and they will just take over a mount. You often lose them. Uh, you can't even see what it's mounted on. Um, that's the best way to grow this species. They're really hard to grow in a pot. Even when you're real careful, they do like a lot of water, and then they like to dry out. Um, but if you want to know how to grow this, you just have to ask Leslie, because clearly <laughs> she's got this figured out. Maxillaria tenuifolia. It's amazing, every time I walk in a greenhouse where the, one of these is blooming, all I can think of is the beach and bikinis because it's got that suntan um, fragrance, just sweet as could be. Um, don't know what else you could say about that other than we've got two morphological variations. This is the normal color form, the one Jerry's got out there. And down below, I think there is a albinistic form. Um, Name is, this clone is Yamada. They don't call it an Alba, but basically that's what this is. Either an Alba or an Aurea. It's hard to say for sure whether that's a green or a yellow. It's something in between maybe, but they both smell the same. I've seen this particular clone and you, if you were blind, you couldn't tell them apart. They smell exactly the same. Decopolis Segunda, uh, this is Linda's. I actually had to look this one up. I don't know that I've ever seen this one uh, displayed before. Um, they get to be pretty nice plants in terms of size, uh, but they don't get to be monster plants. They just grow fairly quickly, um, cover a pot, very much like um, a lot of uh, close relatives. 
Anything else? Okay. Oh, Calias. We got to have Calias. Calia PDA. This is Sue's plan. I've seen this every time I'm there this time of year. This is the cerulea form. This is Shalariana by Lodigesii. Um, and this one's particularly nice. The way the color comes through, contrasted with that yellow uh, in the throat, it goes all the way up into the column. Uh, lots of little spots. Uh, each year when I see this bloom, I think I need to get some pollen and, and make a cross, but I don't know how you improve on this. This is just so, so nice. And I seem to recall this being a fairly robust plant. Am I right, Sue? It grows pretty well. It's once it gets established. It's like all those bifoliates. They got to get started before they get strong. Yeah, that's the, that's the key. And it is interesting. I've seen probably a half dozen of these bloom. And some have no spots, but more intense blue. Um, some are really pale blue, but have lots of yellow that, that makes them look extremely different. You could probably have three or four of these and, and no one would recognize them as siblings unless they look carefully. But that's beautiful, beautiful clone, beautiful hybrid. What else we've got there? Okay, Tigrina Sandbars Giant. This used to be called Gutata variety Leopoldii. So if you've seen Gutata variety Leopoldii uh, on a tag, what you actually have is Tigrina. And the difficulty we have now is that Tigrina actually has different characteristics in breeding than Gattata does. And in the old registrations, um, they didn't separate them. So when you see Gattata in the background of a hybrid made probably before 1980, um, you don't know exactly what's there. But there's one way in which you typically can make a good educated guess, and that's the blooming season. Um, Tigrina blooms early. Um, this is Marv Reagan's plant. My Tigrinas are all in bud. Uh, and the other thing about a Tigrina that separates it from a Gattata is it blooms from a green sheath. So if you've got a plant blooming from a green sheath, even if it's a hybrid, but you see characteristics that are in this particular flower with spots and that openness, um, it's almost certainly uh, has Tigrina in the background, not Gattata. Uh, but Sandbar's giant is a large plant uh, and a large flower for the species. Some of members of this particular species can have as many as 84 flowers per inflorescence. Oh, so goodness. obviously that means the flowers are a little smaller, um, but the inflorescence is, is one of the characteristics that you're breeding for, as well as the spots. And this one is just about as spotted as you're going to find. It's a nice it's a nice clone, and you can find this available for, you know, basically the price of a normal clone. So it's easy to find. And again, as Sue mentioned, when you repot this, basically you only do it when it's getting new roots. And if you do it before or after that, there's a pretty good chance the plant will go into decline. And if you really are smart, you never repot it. You just <laughs> let it walk from one pot to the next, um, or in a basket from one basket to the next. Just give it lots of good drainage and they will thrive. And they get to be pretty large plants, not as big as Gattata, but pretty large. Two and a half feet is probably a normal size for them. Oh, I almost forgot this one on the bottom left. This, I can't see it. It's Pollyanna, I think. Can't remember the. Yeah, Pollyanna. Pollyanna, yeah. That's an interesting hybrid. It's one of those hybrids that, that has a parent that has a variety of different um, species in the background so that you can get a flower like this that has spots and stripes um, and is flared just like uh, Intermedia kinii, which is where that comes from. And then in the same cross, you can get uh, plants with no spots, no stripes, nice flat petals, just because of the way in which the chromosomes segregate um, when you're making a hybrid. And for that to happen, typically both of the parents have to be um, the normal, have the normal number of chromosomes, which is a 2N. If both parents were 4N, you'd see more uni uniformity. You wouldn't see as much variation, but that's really pretty. I've, I've, every time I see this, I like this a lot. What else on that page, Terry? That's it. That's it? Okay. Onward we go. Grassable and nodosta. Still is one of the most uh, beautiful orchids out there, not just because 
It's easy to grow just because it is really, I don't know, delicate in some ways. Yet it's one of the toughest things out there. If I've got anything other than uh, myra, more myrocophora um, that gets a lot of sun, it's Brassavola nodosa. Last year I left one out that gets probably mm, sun except full sun except for maybe an hour a day. And I've never had as many flowers as I have had this past uh, year. Wow. Uh, the, fly, the plant, the leaves will actually get uh, brownish or reddish when you give them a lot of sun. But as long as they're getting a lot of air movement and, and you've got a good watering system on them, they'll thrive and they will grow fast, fill up a basket. Um, and as you're gonna see in a second, it is also probably one of the species that has most been used to make hybrids. I think just about everything in the world has been crossed with Brassavola nodosa. <laughs> and here you have a couple of examples. Uh, Brassavola Richard Mueller, the yellow in the, in the bottom there. Um, that's uh, nodosa crossed with um, the little, well, rock-dwelling lalia called Milleri, a red. And you get this, these beautiful, um, beautiful yellow flowers with spots because nodosa breeds spots. Okay. Hope you all can see that right on the bottom right there. Okay, and then up at the top, you've got a really unusual one. Un unusual in the sense that we don't see this kind of cross made. Encyclavola pic-pic, um, nodosa by encyclia. And encyclias, as we know, in bloom are in bloom right now. Um, they love the heat. They're pretty easy to grow if you keep scale off, off of them. And in this cross, you're seeing what nodosa can do and often does. It puts uh, color in the lip spots. If there was color coming from the other parent, instead of it being a little blotch, it makes little spots and stripes out of it. Um, this is a nice one. It's nice and, and uh, yellowish green. Um, not often do we see that in a, in a hybrid with an encyclia. Most of the time, you'll get the, the color coming from the petals. And Alan says this is a first bloom seedling, too. Cute. Yeah, that, that ought to have, that'll be the interesting thing to see how many flowers it, it can get. Because while Nodosa, you know, doesn't have 20 flowers, it can have five or six on a stem, um, particularly when you match it with something like a Encyclia. You, you could get a pretty high flower count with this thing. We'll have to watch it each year. Okay, what else is there? We've got a little mermaid. Little Mermaid. I looked that one up because I wasn't familiar with it. Um, can anyone tell us anything more about this, where this came from? I guess not. Um, <laughs> I, I, was, I can't see who, who's the owner. That's so. Jerry Fowler's. Okay. Yeah, uh, it's, as I recall, this has, um, this has Catlia. Walkeriana in the background somewhere. Um, it's interesting that it's got so many flowers with the Walkeriana background. Can you raise it up so I can see that name a little better? That, that's what I was trying to do, but I can't. What's the, what's the name on it, Sue? Little Mermaid. Let's see. It's a Walkeriana with a Maikai. Okay. Yeah, Maikai. That's, that's where the flower count's coming from, yeah. the Beringiana in the background. And so Nodosa is a grandparent on this one. Walkeriana is a parent. You can see the Walkeriana in there, but you also can see the, uh, um, the lip coming from the Catley in the background. Looks like it's growing well. Yep. It's Lelia purpurata month. Uh, actually, it was supposed to be last month, but Lelia purpurata blooms in, in May and June, depending on where you are, how much sun you give them. Um, and each year, I'm always shocked at how many varieties there are out there. And try as I may, I can't constrain myself when I see um, crosses made of purpurata by purpurata of different varieties, because they produce all sorts of different uh, colors on the lip, the petals, even splashes. And we've got some beautiful examples here. The striata um, in the upper right, that sues because I have a piece in bloom right now, and it's a showstopper. It's got the stripes, and I don't, I don't know if there is an actual count of the number of varieties, but I'm pretty sure that the number of varieties just keeps going up. 
but this one's got all you want color, um, nice petals. It's not apparent to most people who see the, the perparatas on show tables and, and in the judging center or in shows that the vast majority of perparatas do not have petals as nice as these. Uh, their petals tend to be twisted and that's one of the reasons they weren't used a lot in early hybridizing because it's a dominant trait. Uh, the more I see Lelia perparata, um, the less interested I am in perparata hybrids. I just like them for themselves uh, and, and they're getting better. Some of the latest perparatas that come out of Brazil look like complex hybrids. Um, I'll be interested to see when somebody can test the genetics because they just don't look like perparata. Hmm. Give me some others there. Okay. I think the one on the bottom left is a, Schust is a perparata variety Schusteriana. Um, that's got that, it's hard to describe the color on that. It's a purplish red. Um, and it's, it's interesting watching the experts try to describe the colors because I have a hard time with colors, but the experts have just as hard a time and their, their descriptions vary depending on who's writing it. So I don't feel so bad about having trouble figuring out what the color is. But in anything like a Schusteriana, the real key isn't just the density of the color on the lip, it's also that clarity of white on the petals and sepals. It's that contrast that's so pretty. Um, Walter Mueller's got the, the Valley Isle by self clone up there. And again, the characteristic of that that is striking is how nice and big those petals are. You can see there's a little blush on the, on the petals. This is one of those characteristics that you could have bought this plant and it was crystal white when you bought it and now growing here in Florida, good bright light, and you get a little bit of color. That's not unusual for a lot of orchids, including uh, Lelia perforata. What do we got on the upper left? Lelia, that's, um, looks like a Cernua maybe form. Again, white petals and sepals and that lip color. But now the petals are nice on this, but notice um, on the, the dorsal sepal, see how that folds around and kind of makes a little tube. That's very characteristic of, of Lelia purpurata. Sometimes they even twist more and don't stand up straight. So there's a lot of, of facets of Lelia purpurata that, that judges are looking for. Did I miss one? I feel that I missed one. No, I don't Josephine, think you did. Didn't you? you hit Josephine? No, I didn't. That's it. But that's, there it is, Josephine. That one's really beautiful. Um, the color contrast is nice. You can see maybe a little tiny bit of blush in the petals, but beautiful flower, nice color contrast. The more you look at it, the more intricate you see the flower. Looks like it's being grown well. The other thing that I didn't realize was how many flowers they can get on a stem. I've seen several of them now with seven and eight flowers. I didn't know they could do that, which is a nice characteristic, usually on really good stems too, not down in the, among the leaves. Yeah, John mentioned that there's, they, they typically don't bloom from a sheath. Every now and then you'll see something in there that looks maybe like a sheath, but it's really just a covering, a little bit of a coating from the, um, the bulb formation, and they'll burst right out of that real fast. So don't expect a sheath on them. If you do, you'll be waiting a while. Um, Layla Perparata has been used to make a lot of hybrids. Um, it wasn't favored in the beginning just because of some of the negative characteristics that I mentioned earlier. Um, but the other one that was really negative was that hybrids with uh, purpurata took a long time to bloom. Uh, once they started blooming, they're pretty spectacular and great for making cut flowers. But in the beginning, no one appreciated that. Um, Lelia catlia canhamiana, really straight catlia now. That was a very, very popular cut flower um, plant. And you can kind of see why. Lots of flowers. They're good size. They're um, four to five inches. Um, and it comes in a variety of colors. So you've got semi-albas made with um, different parents. Um, you've got nice colored ones. You even have cerulea ones varieties being made. Uh, it's, a, it's loved by a lot of those, those people. Are there steaks? I don't know. A lot of times, these are, these don't need staking, but what I have seen is that if the 
if the inflorescence comes out and it's growing slowly, in other words, it's not a lot of, not a lot of heat, it will get pretty thick and hard before the flowers open. If inflorescence is growing fast and we're getting a lot of heat, it's a good idea to tie the, or keep the inflorescence growing up and you can tie it. And once the flowers open and the stem hardens, you can take the, the, uh, the bamboo stake or whatever you're using off and the flowers will stand up just fine on their own. You just have to be kind of careful when you're tying it, not to bind it too tightly. Um, we've also got, oh, uh, let's see. The Canhamiana, let's see, is that one on the bottom, Sue, that yours? Is yeah, that's there? the Lobata, that's the, that says oh, that's the, that's okay, the, I couldn't see, yeah, that's, that's the Lobata Jenny. Yeah. That's, um, that's an interesting one. It's one of the few that's been awarded by the AOS. And that's a con color form. Um, in other words, all con color means is that everything is the same. You don't have a, a lip that's got a, a different color. Uh, but the normal form actually has co a colored lip compared to the petals and sepals. This is a really nice one. As I said, it's one of the few that's been awarded. Um, very easy to grow, very much like uh, perforata. And then we have indigo mist. Indigo mist is one that fascinates me because according to Orchid Wiz, this one goes back a long, long way to, to Stewart's orchids. And the hybridizer that did most of this um, did his work, gosh, in the 70s and 80s and tried every kind of combination to make ceruleas. And this is one that came out, and when I look at the parents in the background, I'm still not sure how they got cerulea out of it, but it's hard to know since there are multiple parents going way back and no indicator that one is cerulea, but you wouldn't see that unless somebody named uh, one of them blue something. But that's an old, old clone that's been around a long time and still beautiful, nice color contrast. Okay, up here somewhere, I've got a Pulcherima. Yeah, yeah, up in the top, there he is. Yeah, that's, that's really beautiful. That is um, Purpurata by Lobata. So what we used to call Lalias, now they're Catlias. Um, but you see some of the same characteristics. Lobata has got a lot of the characteristics of Purpurata, but it doesn't have the number of color forms um, and it's just not as striking a flower. It's beautiful just not striking, but that's a nice combination and a beautiful, beautifully grown clone. And down at the bottom, I seem to remember there was one that was really interesting. Oh, there it is. Lelia Catlia Miss Wonderful Imperialis. And if you'll notice the nice inflorescence on this, um, the spike, the stem, whatever you want to call that, um, this is basically a splash petal Catlia put onto Lelia Ancep. Lelia anceps is a, a species from Mexico that grows in a lot of cold, and they grow it outside uh, in Southern California, even though they may get down close to freezing quite frequently. They like a lot of sun, um, and whatever you match the anceps with, the typical uh, hybrid has the color from the cattleya, um, but the growth characteristics from the, the anceps. Just a beautiful clone. I like this but it's a, a beautiful combination of, of characteristics. Okay, any more on that page? No. Nope. It is in cyclia season, for sure. Um, the Guadatom, um, Leslie Brickle, uh, is a typical um, hybrid that you get. One of the difficulties of hybridizing in cyclias is that they're so dominant. So if you hybridize them with anything other than um, another encyclia. The encyclia just dominates and the catlia kind of disappears. You'll enlarge the flower and a lot of times you get the worst of both worlds. Now, Marv Reagan has done a lot of hybridizing with uh, encyclia by encyclia and the trick is in, in the world of encyclias there are species that have tall inflorescences and big beautiful flowers and others that have short inflorescences but lots of flowers and so what is, is ideal and breeding with encyclias is to try to get flower counts that are really good, inflorescences that hold themselves up and branch a lot. Um, and there are a lot of color forms, particularly the, the yellows and greens that you can get by matching uh, encyclias to encyclias. And this Guadatom, I, I know one of the species was a Tampensis, but I can't, 
I don't think I knew what the other one was. But you can see it's a nice, nice blooming clone. How about what's to the left there? Orchid jungle. Orchid jungle. Okay, yeah, there it is. Orchid jungle is a really a famous hybrid. It's one of the um, probably one of the most famous that I can think of. If there was to say there was one famous hybrid, it's a lot of by Phoenicia, and I saw both species growing in the wild in in the Bahamas. And the, the shock was how big some of the bulbs were. The bulbs can get monstrous on both of these. So you can just imagine that this hybrid also has very large bulbs. What's nice about it is you can grow them as smaller plants and they flower very well, um, just like you're seeing here. You give them more sun, get them bigger, and the inflorescence can be five and six foot tall with beautiful dark, dark, dark flowers. Um, this is a nice, this is a nice uh, hybrid one of the best out there. You see a lot of beautifully grown plants down in South Florida because they have the ideal um, growing conditions. Okay, there on the bottom right, um, this is a, an interesting example of a hybrid where the hybridizer is interested in getting certain characteristics into a, a hybrid. Uh, and so this is a second generation where the hybridizer has used one species crossed it to another, and then gone back to that species. And that's the color that you see. When I first saw the photo, I thought it was the species. But there's some other characteristics coming along with it, um, including high flower count. <clears throat> this is sickly and moonlight. Oh, we need the prosthetica. This used to be an encyclia. We all knew it wasn't. Um, but it was easier just to throw it in that group. But now it's prosthetica. There are a bunch of species of this within this genus. This was another one that used to be called the black orchid. Uh, we also call it the upside down orchid and the shell orchid because of the way the lip um, sticks out and, and is shaped like a shell. Uh, it's an interesting group because they're extremely dominant. Um, they often, um, I, I don't know of a case where they don't dominate hybrids. And they're not as easy to hybridize into other um, closely related species like the encyclias. They don't do it like you would think if they were closely related. They're really a pretty separate group, but easy to grow. We near the end? Okay, no, no, okay. Yeah, here we go. Um, epidendrum. It still is on my tongue when I see something that's crossed with encyclia. I call them epicats because they used to all be grouped together. They clearly are different. Epidendrum is, is, epidendrums are clearly different than the encyclias, but it was just convenient in the beginning. And so we still have that legacy. Um, Epidendrum ostridii is beautifully grown. Um, it's a nice species, got this really cool looking lip. And as I recall, that's really fragrant at night. Um, Sue, that's yours, so you should yeah. know. I'll have to go get the flashlight and, and check it out tonight. I think that's very fragrant at night. When I worked at Orchid Nursery as a teenager, I lived on as a nursery and I would go out at night and, uh, and smell things that I never got to smell when I worked there just during the day. <laughs> a lot of the, anything with a white flower or green flower uh, usually was extremely fragrant. And it attracted moths. They, down in the Florida Keys, they used to all get pollinated. So it had um, epidendrum, this particular species had to be in a place where the moths couldn't get to them. Okay, what else on that page? Okay, Aphidendrum radicans. Um, some people like to call this a weed. It's a beautiful weed. It's very easy to grow. And if you can give it a lot of sun, it will flower like that. This is the only orchid that my wife Rose actually owns. Um, <laughs> it's growing out on the deck in a pot. And of course, it's been flowering for a while. And now it's all pollinated because it is a a species that has many pollinators. It's been used in making hybrids as have some of its closely related species and includes some of the hybrids that are very small so they don't get real tall like this one. But you see them in South Florida um, growing almost as hedges on property lines and you can just see those flashes of orange out there. Okay, let's see what do we have down there. Epilalia catlia memoria Bartley Schwartz, Steve Hawkins, and as I recall, I looked this one up and that's Steve Hawkins hybrid. It is. That's really pretty cool. 
you know, it's, it's one of the things that gets lost sometimes when you look at individual flowers, and particularly in judgings, you don't pay attention to the inflorescence, but look at the flower counts on this thing. It's got a lot of flowers, um, nice color, and those are two things that you would like to have in a hybrid, particularly if the, if the goal is the, the display, not necessarily the individual flower. Really beautiful. And then that Epicatlia. It's Burdekin Surprise. Burdekin Surprise. I looked this one up because I had never heard of this one before. It's a really different thing. Um, I can't quite remember right now what, what the hybrid was. It just was species that I didn't usually see mixed together. And I like the greenish color. Um, anything with Burdekin is typically a hybrid made in Australia, a particular um, nursery there registers everything as Burdick and something. Um, and I, I hadn't seen many of this type of hybrid made by him. So I was a little bit surprised, but that's really very pretty. Whose plant is this, Sue? It, uh, this is Janice's. Janice, say, tell him how the color opens and changes as it's open you, for a couple of days. It starts out with the yellow green and then goes into an orangey gold. So that's yeah. actually, I put two inflorescence together to show you the two colors. It's really, it's really nice. And, and now I'm not surprised that it's a Burdekin cross because they really like those bright colors. But the photo doesn't show how gold that really is, I don't think. Yeah. That's not unusual for, for photos. It's hard to get some colors just right. Anything else there? Nope. Okay, Memoria Helen Kritz, Volcano Queen. Um, that's really a beautiful thing. And I really suspect that that's, that one flower is probably not what you're going to see in the future. Because um, the parents of this typically will have two to three flowers. And the other thing I do know, because I've seen this in bloom several times, it can vary tremendously in color, depending on the temperature. This is one of those ones we talk about all the time. Um, when it's in a lot of warmth because the buds are forming, you tend to get this rosy color around the outside of the petals and sepals. And when it's in blooms in the cooler weather, it tends to be solid yellow with just maybe a little tiny blush. But the lip on this is, is striking too. Big, big frilly lip, a nice color. And then that yellow sort of a halo around the, the column. Okay, beautiful. Um, Ranger 6 AOK. -okay. Uh, that still is one of the most beautiful whites you will ever see. It, it goes back into the 60s. And in the 60s, it was spectacular. And today, if you were to walk up on that and the show table, you would just be in awe because it is a nice, large flower. Fairly easy to grow. It's a tetraploid. grows a little slow. But um, it's, it's still easy to grow in flower. Upper right, probably the best hybrid out there as a parent that we have now. This is Edisto variety Carol. And I have this too, mine blooms in the fall. But one of the things about the dark purples is they have a huge dose of Dowiana, which is a summer bloomer. And it is not uncommon for them, if they're grown well in a big plant, to do just what you see here, to see it flowering in the summertime, to get to um, to growths. This is Oconee, um, oh, by Marie Ozella. And Marie Ozella is not, does not have great shape, and Oconee doesn't have that great a shape, they, at least not like this. Some of them popped out like this one with really amazing shape and unbelievable color. This is a red purple in the wintertime. Summertime, it might be a little bit more on the purple side, but no matter when it flowers, it's striking. And it's turning out to be uh, this particular Grex, including this particular um, clone, turning out to be a great parent. Uh, I buy, anytime I see just about anything with uh, RLC, Edisto, I buy some to see what they're gonna do. And I don't know that I've ever been disappointed. The seedlings themselves, when you bought seedlings of the original cross, you had about a one in 10 chance of getting a, an amazing one and nine in 10 chances of getting something that was pretty, but just not what you would use to breed. So it was a low percentage, but as a parent, this is a high percentage parent. 
Okay, somewhere down there we've got something else. Okay, on the bottom right. That's George King. I can't that's, quite that's see. Heitzing Williet. Yeah. There you go. You said it you said it better. So. <laughs> <laughs> Well, now, now we're on to Jim Graham there. Oh, there we are. <laughs> Is that the one you want? To... Yeah. Where are we? The yellow one. The yellow one. That's Jim Graham, right? No. No. This is at High Sing Williet. Okay. That sounds better. <clears throat> High Sing Williet. And I'm trying to remember the pay. I just totally lost the parents on this, Sue. Well, you can talk about Jim Graham, and I'll go look up the parents. Yeah, I can't remember what that is. I looked it up the other day. Jim Graham is really an interesting one. Um, this was a cross made by Joe Grisafi, a friend of mine, and it's a George King cross. And George King almost always makes something really nice. Um, and I know that the, the name of this one um, is because Joe Grisafi really liked the guy, because if he doesn't like you, he names an ugly cross after you. <laughs> so this is a really beautiful thing. So clearly he really liked this. George King is almost universal in making really nice hybrids. And it can, it can do all sorts of things with the color of the other parent. It can make it, uh, it can intensify it. It can make splashes. It can mute it. You just quite never know. But everything that comes out of it is pretty. So if you're not looking for one particular color, George King crosses are really nice to have too. So that other one is Tokyo Magic with Willie at Wong. That's right, Willie at Wong. That's a famous kind of uh, parent that comes out of the, the East and it's got phenomenal color. I mean, I, you, can't, you can't beat the color of Willie at Wong and most of its offspring are really nice. If it has a detractor, at least in my opinion, it's the fact that when they grow in really warm conditions or hot like we have, a lot of times the buds don't really um, open well. They're opening before they really even get out as sheath. Um, in cooler conditions, that's not an issue. But that contrast between the lip and the petals and the sepals, it couldn't be more extreme. That's about as extreme as you can get. And this one, I think the Tokyo Magic is a semi-miniature. So this is a smaller flower too. I'm just not familiar with the cross. But that's beautifully grown. And who's, who's planted that's that? Sharon, who's? That's Sharon Hans. Very, very nice, very nice. We get right, last time. slide coming up. Yeah, Schimberkia, these are, this is Schimberkia time. Um, and of course, the name of these has been changed. The Schimberkias um, have been eliminated. The, the genus is gone. And so if they have hollow bulbs, they're Mimorcophila, if they have solid bulbs, they're Lelias. Um, and the, the hollow bulb types are mostly from the Caribbean and Northern South America, have interesting relationships with ants. That's what the hollow bulbs are for, for the ants to have a place to live. I've got one of these in my citrus. Um, I left it out um, almost all year long. And what I have is the Schomburkia or the Mimarcophila tibicinus that Glow has there. Just beautiful to have these long inflorescence. And if you were to look at my um, orange tree, you would think it was blooming with funny flowers because the inflorescences go straight up through the top, through the canopy, and they're above the, above the, the leaves. And uh, it's also one of those species that's easily pollinated by our local pollinators. So I have a lot of, a lot of pods. I worry that seeds are gonna get loosened. And it's gonna be an escapee and I'm gonna be blamed for it. <laughs> but theoretically, it's a little too cool here for it. But if the climate keeps changing pretty soon. We'll probably see that growing in the wild too, just like they do in, in Hawaii. Um, Schomburgia thompsoniana, the one Steve Hawkins has got there, that's a really small thing. So if you just like the idea of the Schomburgia but just don't have space for it, the thompsoniana is one of the species that is really, really nice. And it actually makes nice, more compact hybrids too. They'll be bigger, of course, depending on what you cross it with. Um, but it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Again, the little curly petals and sepals. I know Sue has a love for these. And, and I just visited a nursery two days ago, and it was all I could do to not bring home three or four of, of Schomburgia or Marmacophila hybrids. Uh, 
but they're cute, very cute. Long, nice, nice long inflorescences, even on the, the Thomsoniana. I think there's a hybrid there too, isn't there? Yeah, the luster with Forbes EI. Forbes EI. Well, the luster is the hybrid. Okay, I'm not seeing this. On the top left. Oh, there it is, okay. John McCatley a luster. One of the one of the downsides, I think that maybe maybe it's what reduced the number of hybrids made with the Mimarcopla years ago, is that when you cross it with Catlias, hoping to get you know these beautiful colors onto the the hybrid, often what happens is the flower count is drastically reduced, just two or three. You still have a very long inflorescence, and most of the time um, the Schimberkia dominates. And often in the lip, you see a little small lip like this one, but in the best of them, you get beautiful colors and often a nice short lip. So I don't know whether this is one that is just a, a one inflorescence and some of the flowers have gone off of it or whether it has more flowers, uh, but Glow can answer that, I'm sure. So Terry, show the, show the shop, show Joey and Sean Berkia to the right to show everybody how they grow. <laughs> there you go. And that is a, that's the best way to grow them. I mean, they, they love to be mounted. I think that mine was originally in a basket. The basket rotted away and I put it in a wire basket and I don't, I don't think there's anything in there anymore other than just plant. Um, but that is what they like to do. They like a lot of sun. This is the only species that I know of where people grow them in full sun here in, in Florida. Um, I mentioned Joe Grizzoffi and the first time I visited him, he had a fence and he had all his Schimberkias uh, and that included the ones that we now call Lalia. He had them on a fence, just basically no, not, nothing there, just a plant with a wire tied around it, just on the fence, full sun, and they got watered every morning or whenever it rained. And they were, you know, dark red, purple sometimes, but they just flowered like you can't believe. And the plants were perfectly healthy. They just had those bright colored leaves from the sun. Uh, but as long as they were getting good air movement, they did fine. But in nature, they get a lot of sun. A lot of times, they'll, you'll see them growing on fence posts in full sun uh, in, on the islands. Do we miss anything? No, I think you got it. Courtney, you did a great job the way you always do. Well, if there's so much here. I just uh, If I had a better memory, <laughs> I could go forever. You're probably yeah, glad right. I don't have a better memory. Yeah. <laughs> well, right, thank you all. To the last slide. So these meetings are great. We love listening to Courtney, but we can't wait till we can meet again. Um, maybe by the end of June, things will, will have gone into phase two of the reopening. Um, we've got a Kiki Club planned at our house at the end of June. Everybody loves the repotting party. There's lots of divisions. You can bring plants to repot. Um, yes, we need to keep our fingers crossed that the reopening continues to go well. Uh, and then we're going to try to have, if we can, the meeting on July 7th, but keep, keep uh, up to date with the website. The most current news will always be there on the website. Sounds so thank great. you, everybody. Thank Thanks you. Great yeah, job for you. Everybody, everybody in real life. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're looking forward to it. Bye. Take Bye. care. Bye-bye, y'all.